Reagan. And I'm Lisa Jackson. We're happy you could join us this evening. And we are going to be t starting with the very exciting topic of how to choose the right fit college. We are lucky <laughs> to have guest Linda Katz with us, Thank who you. has been doing this for how many years? Uh, nine years in this particular role. Nine years in this right, because you're a mom and you've looked at it from the other perspective, right. but now you have a business doing this. Good so, you, yeah, so how about if we start with um, what should kids be thinking about and how would they plan ahead of the final hour, like the senior year? What do they do leading right. up to that? Okay. Well, so uh, what I always try to talk to parents about is, you know, starting early on in high school, really even... Like freshman year. As, like, yeah, but yeah. even as far back as eighth grade, to yep, just be sure. aware of it, the classes that students are taking mm -hmm. are going to affect then the classes that they'll be recommended for for high school. Yeah, and my so. daughter actually all through middle school was talking about it. And luckily in Hopkinton, I think they're very, right. you know, they have that nice track right and, and I think they kind of help the kids along and they kind of guide them where they'll succeed yeah. and, and I think that's what it should be is where they'll succeed if a kid yeah. should not be in an honors right. class then they sh then they shouldn't be pushed into an honors class because right. it'll be stressful and they probably won't do well so usually the teachers are pretty helpful with that yeah, yeah and we have to sign off on parents have to sign off on the co the choices yeah so the guidance counselor mm -hmm. suggests things kids may pick an AP class Guidance counselor says, well, parent can say, no, I really don't think so. Right. You know, right. so. So all that's good. But I think it's, it's helpful for students to understand, because at that age they typically don't, that these choices they make now will affect their choices sure. later on and their ability to at some point have some options for college. So, again, just to kind of encourage students, you know, you always want to try to take the most challenging courses mm -hmm. you can yep. that are still, that you're still able to do well in the class. Right. Um, so, so pushing students a little bit, but, you know, still allowing them to, to be in the right level for them. So are there extracurricular activities that look good on that college resume that, you know? Well, I, I guess I'd say I wouldn't go so much for looking good as for finding things that the student is truly interested in passion. and passionate about yeah, sure. and ideally they're going to find one or two things that they stick mm -hmm. with through high school instead of you know kind of waiting until junior year and then kind of padding their resume by adding a bunch right. of clubs or yeah, whatever. Yeah they can see that. It's, yeah it's, they can see sure. that and also really the main piece of all this is to try to help the student grow and and gain some experiences and sure. figure out what they're interested in yeah, um, and maybe try something and it's not the right fit and try something else but yep. then settle on something that works for them and allow them to really dive right. deep a little bit you know if it's in their repertoire possibly you know get into a leadership role in that in that club or or organization or excel in a sport or become part of drama or whatever it is that it might be a volunteer thing yeah. um, it could you know and also for kids eventually in high school getting a part-time job those are right. all great things that you know colleges love to see but more importantly are good to help the student Oh. Learn about themselves, learn about their strengths, their challenges, right. what they're And that's so in. important to say that because you really, I think we're in a society that's so geared like you go do this, you be a doctor, a lawyer, I mean that's kind of old fashioned, but you know, go to college and you do these things, but I think it's so important to kind of build a foundation while they're young to really find their likes and dislikes and where they can succeed and because anybody that has passion for something there or it it's something that's very interesting to them they're gonna obviously apply more energy to it and hopefully excel at it definitely and you know just helping i even talk to kids as they get further into high school about trying to do some job shadowing yeah so you know oh kids, yeah kids that say to me that you know they'd like to be a teacher and i right. said well you know have you ever worked with children have you babysat have you mm -hmm. right you know, what about either volunteering or getting a part-time job at a, a preschool or an after-school program or awesome. um yeah. and you know because maybe they don't even like kids <laughs> right. 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 right we've had we've had students come to elmwood school and, and they're high school students, right. but they've been doing that, sort of just supporting in a classroom. That's awesome. And because they're not a teaching assistant, they're not a sub, you know, they're right. not training um, or interning, they're just helping out as a way of right. looking at to see if this, is this something I really love or not? Right. Right. So I think job shadowing is a great thing right. to do in high school. Yep, and another thing I think it's really important is just for parents to realize, you know, once you're hitting the high school years, I mean, ideally even before this, but you're really starting to work on your child being more independent. Sure. You know, waking themselves up with their own oh, alarm, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. allowing them to sleep through it and have the consequences, yeah. you know, allowing them to forget something and have the consequences so that they begin to become more independent. And it, this is a long process. 
process. You don't just start, no. you know, senior I summer. I started really young. <laughs> you don't start <laughs> you senior know. summer of high school saying, okay, we got to work on some things here. Right. And it's more about just the laundry, you know, like having them starting to make their own appointments. And mm -hmm. yes, and, and the, the consequences for things mm -hmm. are important because it's really important for your child to fail some during high it's school. It's life, yeah. Um, you know, if the they go off to college and they have not had experiences of being allowed to fail and having to pick themselves back up and realize that life goes on mm -hmm. right, and exactly. learn some coping skills to get through yeah. it, yeah. Um, then they will not do well at college, no matter how smart or academically prepared they are. You know, it's called uh, resilience. There's a, exactly. a book out that came out a few years back that was popular called Grit. Grit. Um, so, and that's a, a nice one to, to read, it. which just talks about, you know, that's what you really need to be successful in college sure, is you right. need to be resilient and be able to bounce back. So there's a lot of rescuing that parents do of their kids right. um, and we all need guilty to, yeah we all need to <laughs> take a step back and let them yeah. um, kind of struggle right. right and you know as as I say to parents when the kid goes off to college and they call home and say this happened or that happened that you want to say oh, you know I'm sorry to hear that what are you thinking you're going to do about it? What are you going right. to do about it? You yeah. know, and ha having them begin to start to think that and look look for other places. You know, at school they might they're going to talk to their teacher or they might go see their guidance counselor. Or right. you know, it's not always mom or dad who's going to fix it for no, them. No, and I full heartedly agree with that. And I kind of started <laughs> with Celia younger. I mean, I yeah. grew up out west mm -hmm. in Idaho, so I think we you know growing up in the country and stuff like that, you have a little bit of a different attitude. And sure, you know, my daughter was always like, "You should be the mom that comes and picks me up." And I'm like walk it off you know? <laughs> you know so you know like I'm a little bit you right, know right. on the rougher edge of things but I mean now I have a 14 year old daughter that she's works very 35 responsible. hours she's a week amazing. she yeah. works you know she's very yeah. does drama she tutors she you know Bandit. but and she doesn't want me involved I mean unless she needs me I'm like right. so I feel like my job as a parent I've I've let her fall. I've let her make those mistakes. I, you know, and when she's gotten in discussions or had a teacher that she might not disagree with, I said, that's life. Right. You're going to run into people like that in life or exactly. other students that they don't disagree with. And I always say, you know, I, I always tell her, I don't do kid politics. Right. Oh, you, the, you, drama, yeah, the drama. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So and I, yeah, I always told her, take care of it, figure it out. Like, right. you have to be in class with this person for the year. So it's your job to out. figure out how to optimize the relationship right. and make right. it work. And it then, also, um, I have to say, there are two, I, you know, there's the helicopter parent right. who hovers. And then there's and a hover low rough. And yeah. then there's a snowplow parent. This is a new thing I'd heard of a few oh. years ago. Snowplow parent tries to push everything out of the way to make it easy. Right. Oh, right. yeah. So, no, I like the, it, I like the so stumbling well, blocks. So I don't know yeah. if there's a combo <laughs> helicopter snowplow it person. It sounds similar. But, right. right. Just, yeah. I think if everyone just thinks about, you know, we need, I mean, it may be a little bit more to when some of us were raised, a little sure. bit more like, you know, hey, you yeah. go out there and you, sh you come back at dinner time and you've had some experiences. Right. <laughs> right. And, so you eat a little dirt. Okay. It's probably yeah. good for you. Right. You don't need to sanitize right. everything. And, and certainly the, I work <laughs> with, I uh, specifically work with students with some learning differences. Oh. Okay. occupational therapist by background yes, so yes. certainly the many parents have had to be more involved with their kids because sure. they've had some sort of um, learning difference sure. or needed some extra support but still Mm -hmm. Even those parents, you know, I still, we, we work on it that they still have yeah. to separate from their kids. The kids yep. have to separate from them, working on independence. And, right. um, you know, obviously you want to, they've had to fight all these years to get their kids all the support they needed in school. Right. right. And so now it's hard to then sort of Let go launch of them. Yeah. 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 So, but also teaching all our kids, whether they're kids who have learning differences or not, right. to advocate for themselves because everybody yeah. needs help with something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. know, so to learn their strengths, learn the areas where they really could use some help with. Yeah. And the student needs to learn that and be able to talk about it. Right. And to right. be able to, it's no big deal, mm -hmm. but this is an area that I need some help with. Because right. um, when they go to college, there's no mom, the college right. is <laughs> right. saying, or dad saying, um, oh, my child needs help with this. Yeah. Right. Um, they will and have we don't to... see it as much because they're not in front of us. Right. You know, like right. now when in high school age, you see them, they're at home with you. You right. know what I mean? And you're sitting with them while they're studying or you're, you know, doing sure. all those not things. Not in so, high school. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, well, not, not quite so much. You, yeah, you, you, no. you don't know as much what's going on until there's a problem. Exactly. Right. Um, and the thing I love yeah. that you, you know, I think having them go through this in high school 
mm-hmm. means that they're not going to hit college right. unprepared and say, oh my gosh, what am I going to do, you right. know? Um, right, because colleges are saying in the last, you know, five years especially that so many students on their campuses are struggling with anxiety and depression. Of course. Yeah. And of course that, you know, are. that's a di- change from the past. There was always some, yeah, but right. way more. And they're feeling like it's because kids, again, are arriving somewhat, in some cases, academically unprepared, right. but unprepared oh. to, to fail. Right, right. And right. everybody is going to well, get their gets first, a their first right. C or D on a, on a mm-hmm. test and they're, you know, they don't know how to go on or right. there's a um, a social situation that exactly. didn't go their way and they don't know how to recover right. from that. Um, so those are things that really, if, if a kid can't come back from, bounce back from that, that's a problem. Well, so it I, sounds like the, it, yeah. so it sounds like you're saying the academics are things you need to plan for um, since from starting in eighth grade ish, but almost more important or equally as least as equally important is giving them coping skills, giving them resilience, helping them practice some of the things that they might have to encounter, they might encounter right, right. in a college situation when they right. don't have the helicopter or the snowplow or the <laughs> hand holding sure. yep. parent to to help them through those things. Definitely. You and know, many, and then God forbid they turn to drugs or some other bad coping, thing to, right, to cope. Right, right. So we need to help them get the coping skills before they get into the independent right. situation. And you know, many kids don't have skills for whatever reason by this time in high school. You know, they're the term these days is called executive functioning yes, skills. Yes. And it's like the planning and the yeah, prioritizing and the time management and right. all of that. And many kids still struggle with that, whether they have a diagnosis of anything or not. My dad right. still struggles with that at 89. Yep. God bless him. <laughs> so, right. so that's really important for, you know, if, if uh, parents or the kid himself or um, school is is identifying that these are problem areas right. that's important to address absolutely ideally it happens in school sometimes people find that they need to get an outside academic coach or someone sure. to help with that kind of thing and it's often really time and money well spent to help the kid you know then sure. organization arrive. yes is yes huge. i mean really it should, they should yeah. be learning this all in grade school right and they should come you know margie you guys you start with them at your age oh, second oh, third grade. Yeah. yeah so like, but but some kids that just you know don't have it and we all know that the the brain of of these adolescents is still maturing for right. till 25. Well, yep. they're now saying 30. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. I know. Oh, so, no. so you've got a while. But, right. but anyway, those type of things are just as important as, you know, how you're going to do on your math test. I mean, right. all those exactly. organizational skills. Some some kids are very intelligent, but they don't hand in their homework because they can't find it or they lost right. it or whatever. Well, or they, uh, and I don't think my son will kill me if I say this, but when he got a new laptop, yeah. he was There's working, working, curve. working. I thought, oh my gosh, he's taking so long to do his homework. It's really, I think he needs help. He was just playing games, right. but it looked to me like he was doing homework because he is uh, very smart. But he, what he was doing was he was distracted by this new amazing toy right. and this capability. Sure. And so it was hard for him to put that away yeah, to focus on right. the boring thing. Yeah, right. You know, because right. that's yeah. wow, and I get it. You know, so so those kinds of temptations, you you might even have to set up a system where the laptop, computer, phone isn't in the bedroom. You know, it's downstairs being charged or whatever, so that there isn't the temptation in the middle of the night. You know, oh yeah, there's a thing. Yeah, um, right. sure. There's you know, there's all kinds of things. Thing. So it's so sometimes it is these. Um, other areas that creep into, sure. you know, that are just as important, as you say, almost more important in some ways for some students. Mm-hmm. Um, but then, you know, just back to that, that as students get a little bit older yeah. um, and are thinking actually about colleges, I think it's really important to start broadly by right. just talking about what are the appropriate characteristics that you're looking for in a college. And then, you know, we are lucky enough to have so many schools nearby that you right. can go and see right. a small school and see a larger school and see a city school and see a more rural school. So um, how do students go about figuring out like a, a, a major? Because that, that seems like a really difficult thing to do because, you know, I wanted to be a veterinarian, I went into the medical field, you know what I mean? So there was a lot of things that I didn't necessarily in Idaho have those counseling skills. I was right. thinking I might be a welder. Or, I mean, there were like so many things up in the air and I kind of stumbled 
through that and figured it out. But I mean, are there tools that you can use with kids that are younger? Because Celia for a while wanted to be an astrophysicist, but then she's like, I really like people. I don't want to be locked up, you know, right, writing right. code or whatever. And, well, well, certainly some of these mm-hmm. things we've been talking about, getting out and doing some volunteering, doing mm-hmm. a part-time job, doing some job shadowing, those are all things to help. Um, I know they do do an assessment at the high school, mm-hmm. um, I think sophomore year that helps. I know with my students I do a little more uh, comprehensive one. But so some of those interests and aptitudes assessments can help yeah, yeah um, but then cool. just getting out there in the world early mm-hmm. on and trying right. these things and then start you know a student has an experience okay well how did you like that working with right. people you know really I'd much rather be in the back room stocking shelves that's mm-hmm. that's good information it is you know I mean and so so someone mm-hmm. who's and also that helps you too when you're thinking about class sizes at college sure, exactly. mm-hmm. so large some college, students college, some yeah. students you know if they're in a large uh, lecture hall of right. 350 oh. kids right. they're right. going to be playing a game on their computer or taking a nap or and the professor won't notice right and um if they have adhd and have a hard time paying attention they probably need to be in a smaller class where mm-hmm. the professor will notice right yeah. um for a student who might be on the spectrum or have nonverbal learning disabilities and it's hard for them to speak up and have those um on the spot social connections in a small discussion group yeah. right. they may not be appropriate for a seminar style class of sure. 15 kids that they're so going that's to where we go spot. to the right fit. Right. Exactly. So you have to find this, the circumstance, the, the arena in which right. you can right. succeed. And I think my humble opinion is, of which I have several, that <laughs> you don't necessarily need to identify the major when you right. get to the school. Right. So again, follow well, your mind. passions. Yeah. If, you, if you work with your passions when you're in high school, or even through something like Girl Scouts or Boy Scouts, right. they have all those triads and those mm-hmm. badges and things yeah. you can test out different things. It's so cool. Right. Um, so you identify your interests, but then when you get to college, then you take courses. And I'm going to have two examples here. One is. I knew I wanted to be a teacher when I was a kid. Yeah. The oldest child, I'm helping my mom, whatever. Right. But when I got to college, they said, no, there are not a lot, there are not a lot of jobs. You should think about something else. And I said, mm-hmm. uh, but this, but I, no, you should think about. So then I had to take general courses. Uh-huh. You know, do I want to do hotel, restaurant, and travel? Do I want to major in Spanish? Do yeah. You, I ended up majoring in English because that's where I got the A's, you know. Right. But then I came out and I went and got my master's degree in education because that's really what my right. passion was. So that was one story. The other story is my ex husband. Um, went in as an accounting major because mm-hmm. his parents said, oh, this is a great job. You're really good at math and you should be accounting. Right. He took a wildlife biology class, loved, loved, loved it. Right. And that's what he ended up majoring in. Interesting. So even though you think you know what your major right. is, you could get into a class and just be, those lights could all, whoa. Yeah, and Celia's dad, same thing. That's he went to Berkeley School of Music and yeah. got a degree, a bachelor's of music science, and then... He writes software, you right? Know, like and that's what engineer. that's what my ex husband yeah. is doing too. He's yeah. a computer guy. So I mean, so I mean, the major isn't the major. Well, I mean, issue. I think that it's helpful for kids to start looking into things because if it does turn out that they think they want to be a teacher or a nurse or an engineer and they've had a time to really do some job shadowing and put some yeah. time in yeah. to explore that, then it can be helpful and the most cost effective and time effective to know that because then they have to apply to a school that has an engineering right. program exactly. or has a nursing program right. and maybe applying right into that program. Yeah, right. They that's may not know that from the beginning and right. then yeah. they can always do and it as okay. a master's or whatever but also it is still true that about two thirds of students change their major once right. they get to school. So you know you can explore all that but I wouldn't you know get crazy about it just right. try to find it I think it's it's helpful again if someone wants to be a um, you know graphic designer let's say you have to go to a school that has that right you know? exactly. so, right. so um, it, sure and that's part of the part of the weaning out processes or right. I think that's the right word so so I'm, figuring out colleges in your small collection of colleges that have right. the ability to do the coursework that you want the right. size that you want in large, small, city, oh, rural, right. those little pieces. And the appropriate academic level. And the right. appropriate, I mean, if your student is taking all college prep level classes and they're applying to schools where all the students applying there are taking all AP classes, they're, they're not gonna, that's Ooh, not gonna be right. the right yeah. Yeah. That's Not only would they probably not be admitted, but even if they were somehow, yeah. um, they wouldn't be able to keep up. Be right. Right. Yeah. Right. And you, you know, you don't wanna get in over your head. I think right. it's right. important to be in an environment that's gonna be academic challenging yeah but not so much that the student is swimming and not able to to you know well, they need to have a life right. because yeah. it's too much right right, right. well and another, another thing and I have a couple of really close friends that their kids are going you know some had gone off to college and some are going off to college the cost is so mm-hmm. exorbitant and mm-hmm. 
you know, they're like, oh, it's geez. crazy cost. You know, well, my my one of my best friends, she's like, I think my daughter will only come out of school with thirty thousand dollars in debt. So that to me is is a, is a scary. I mean, like at my age, I wouldn't want thirty thousand dollars. I mean, a lot I have of mortgage. people have that. Yeah, but I mean, that's another thing in the yep. consideration of when you're looking for a college. Is this something? that is, you know, can you afford it? Can it give you a job on the other end? And I think a lot of people go off to college because they have a passion for something, but it may not ever serve them in a job setting. So I I want to know, what. how do you counsel people on that? Keep in mind too, you know, not that many people here in our community do this, but you certainly can go to community college for um, two years or to one of the state universities or or state public schools, you know, Framingham State or any of the others. Um, and mm-hmm. all the way up to UMass, which is, as yeah. you know, much more selective these days. Yeah. But um, <clears throat> but certainly the education that you get there can be just fine, especially if you want to really save some money, go to community school, live at home for two years, yeah. and then transfer forever you I've want. I've heard that. And yeah. the, the degree. your degree is from mm-hmm. that school. It doesn't yeah. even say anything about the community college. Right. So if finances are an issue, that right. certainly is a way to go. Um, you know, there are some private schools that are expensive, but that if your student, well, almost all of them are expensive. Yeah. <laughs> but if your student is in the top, let's say, quarter um, right. of the applicants who are applying, right. then they will probably offer them merit aid, which is you know based on their grades or their mm-hmm. test scores or mm-hmm. their extracurricular activities, yeah. et cetera. Um, and then if that happens, that can bring down the price substantially. But if they're applying to schools that they can barely get into, yeah. then they're probably not going to be offered any money or right. very little. And the other thing that is good to note is the, the term need blind. Mm-hmm. When oh, you apply to a college and the, the scholarships are need yeah. blind, that means they're just looking at the academics. They're oh. not looking at the income of the parents or whatever. They're just looking at the academics and they're giving the um, preference the scholarships based on the academics. Oh. Well, well, so need blind would refer to just need based aid. So right. the money is going is not based on the academics. It's right. based on. I mean, they get admitted to the school based on the academics, but the but what the scholarship. They're not looking at the need based aid, which is the. Um, federal aid versus the merit aid, yeah. which is based on, which are more called scholarships, yeah. the mm-hmm. merit aid, um, right. based on grades or a GPA. Or right. sometimes if you're going a little farther away from your home, right. a school will be more apt to want to have you come and maybe offer you some money because they want a kid from Massachusetts Diverse. if they're in Idaho. Right. <laughs> Diverse. Yeah, they, right. Or, or they want a kid that has a, a racial background, possibly. or sure. Just diversify wanna, the, yeah, that, the that college. They want a kid who... Um, if they have many of the liberal arts schools, or at least 60, 40, um, 60 female, percent female oh, and 40 oh, yeah. or more percent male. So if you're a, males. a boy at a liberal arts school, if you're a girl at a business or engineering right. school, all yep. these are all ways that students, but still it needs to be the it needs to be a good fit for the student. Right. Sure. But, but that's a, in a way to look at it. You know, I mean, the just, demographics. Yeah, when you're looking but at that, I didn't realize they that. And that yeah. makes sense. I mean, they want a well-rounded And I also think that, that families can early population. on um, in high school begin to figure out where they fit financially. Mm-hmm. Um, there's something called, people have to fill out something called the FAFSA for financial mm-hmm. aid. It's a free financial aid form, federal. Um, so it's F-A-F-S-A. Okay. And then if you put the number four and then caster, so FAFSA oh. for caster, okay. if you Google that. that, people can sit down with a you know, they like a glass of wine in their tax return and, <laughs> and, and, figure it fill, out. and fill in those numbers. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's an algorithm that kind of gives you yeah, and, and it'll give you an idea of what you're looking for is your expected family contribution. Yeah. And that's what the that's government good. thinks that you should pay. And you can get an idea of that and then begin to have discussions with your child. Yeah. Say, okay, this is how much we can pay per year. Right. And if you go to a school, it could cost more than that. If they give you money that brings it down to this level, great. Yeah. If they don't, then that one's not going to work out for us. Right. So and that that everyone important. has that conversation up front so yeah. a student is not, but I got accepted, but they didn't give you any money. You need to have that conversation right. up front because right. you don't always know. The disappointment level would be right. Right. challenging. So well, as long as and early on, I, I would think when you start planning that even, in, like you said, you do that forecast, but even have that conversation with your kids and just say this is this is what we need to look at, you know, because right. my daughter, I'm a single mom, so she knows things, you know, knows a lot Me about too. money because I explain it to her all the time, right. and she, you know, that would be certainly something I would discuss with her. But it, and I, it's funny because, um, and we have to wrap it up, but um, in terms of finances, 
when you're a single mom, they usually don't look at the um, non-custodial parent's income. Oh, so they look at the, the, the income. Oh, right, it depends. <laughs> so, so I'm usually so right. So that's another factor oh. is if they're just looking at the the joint resident. Yeah. Right. The re, if the child lives with one parent or or even one day over six months a year. Right. That's whoever they live the most with. Right. But, they but just to add, I, I we have to wrap up. But there for for many some private schools um, over 350 mm -hmm. or so um, you also had to fill out a separate form called the CSS profile oh, okay. and that form they can choose whether they want to look at the included or not parents okay oh, so those are a lot those of things tends to, know. to be private schools a yeah. few of the high flyer public schools are on that list but most of them are private so yeah wow. um, anyway. good to know that yeah yeah That's... but I think the main thing is for to wrap up is for parents to think about you know getting their kids out there in the world yes yeah. Um, exploring <laughs> things, you know, getting out there. Even the kids are going to be uncomfortable and reluctant, but encourage them to yeah. get out there and try new things. Mm -hmm. Helping them become more independent, and, and then encouraging them to be to be academic and know that that will affect their choices later on. Yeah. Um, Perfect. Excellent. Okay. Thank you so much for Thank sharing you. your wisdom. That was an amazing amount of information. Yeah, it was great. Well, helpful. it was fun to talk with you guys. Thank yeah. you. Thank okay. you so much. All right. Take Thank care. You. We'll see you in a. This week on the Concerts of the Commons series, the Roy Scott Big Band. signs of an opioid overdose and how can I recognize that somebody is experiencing one? Well, they're actually pretty easy to spot. A person who is experiencing an overdose may appear confused and have a decreased level of consciousness and alertness. They also may have constricted pupils. When you see somebody who's experiencing an overdose, the number one most important thing to do first is to call 911. Next, do rescue breathing. And finally, take out your naloxone kit and administer the naloxone. Naloxone comes in an easy to use package with instructions for how to use it. Each box of Naloxone may look different. They're all very easy to use and you do not need medical training in order to use it. So who should have nasal Naloxone? Well, everybody should have it to help a loved one who may be suffering from a substance abuse disorder or just to help a stranger in need. Obtaining Naloxone is easy. You can obtain it from your doctor, from a pharmacy standing order, or from any of the Department of Public Health sites. By just following these simple steps, you might just be able to save a life. And we're back. Yes. <laughs> Welcome back. We are going to talk about Kev Kelvin Drogemeyer, yeah, who was, is yeah. uh, Trump's new science advisor right. pick. Science um, and technology. Science and technology. And sometimes used as science advisor, but not necessarily. There's, right. a lot, there's some technicalities here. Yeah. So, um, Fun fact, I have to tell you a fun fact. A lot of fact. fun facts. Yes, so it was interesting. Um, the name Kelvin, is, which is also known yes. as a measurement of temperature, right? which I thought was kind of funny, so I thought that was kind of Yeah, it's amazing, that yeah. He, it's amazing that he has this name. And he's a meteorologist. And yeah, his specialty is yeah. atmospheric something or other. I, right. I wrote no, I was looking thing. up all this stuff, and yeah. he has a very he's apt, notable... He's aptly named. Yeah, and yeah. And the other thing that's really cool is... Carolyn Dykema approves of yep. him. She's a Democrat. Yeah. Um, he's been nominated by Trump, so right. that's Right, and he worked, he advised for bipartisan Bush guy. and Obama. Yep. And the second Bush and Obama, yep. Yep. And I, so Forbes, I got a little article from Forbes yeah, saying that he's an expert in extreme weather events. Yep. Served on the faculty of University of Oklahoma in Norman for 33 years, so yeah. clearly a valued employee, right. someone stable, right. someone intelligent, someone uh, yeah. respected, has been both an administrator, university administrator, as well as vice chair of right. governing board of the National United States National Science Foundation. So right. incredible background. Right. And, and obviously a, a caring and, and 
really a passion for this world. The only thing that I found that was kind of interesting is it's taken since the Trump administration started to actually nominate someone for this yeah, position. Weird. So it's been empty for that long. 19 months. Yeah, and really that Office of Science and Technology Policy has yeah. been vacant since the start of the um, administration. So that's that's a little bit that's a little bit tricky and you would hope, you know, given what's going on in the world that we would be looking at this a little bit closer, but, um, and yeah. there was some discussion about hopefully that the president takes the council and, you know, in the way right. that he would move forward policy in this, this world. And I, someone who works in disaster response and deals with natural disasters, mm -hmm. this, you know, I was reading, I was very pleased to, that this was the nomination. Oh, yeah. They're the nominee, but it was, um, yeah, you I know, I, I hope that the administration decides to really take his expertise and, and whoever he hires his staff on and really listen to what they right. are bringing forward because I really feel like we're at a point mm. in um, in time that we really need to take a very close look at what you know, we're doing with the environment and right. how and it's I affecting all of us. Exactly. It's pretty selfish not to. Oh, well, yeah. it's not only selfish, it's foolish because right. the future depends on what the choices we make now just like uh, Linda was saying with college right if we make bad choices with our environment right. now four the years future make is a, a big disaster. difference right or six years make a big exactly difference. so Trump even though Trump had uh, appointed him right he doesn't necessarily have to take his advice on right. science policy right he's in a he could be an advisor but he Right. He has him in the role, but he isn't necessarily going to. Well, and another thing seems that to do a lot of things on his own. So right. Well, and hope. another thing is, I mean, he's a proponent of um, epidemic preparedness, which is beyond, you know what I mean, Cl climate Pandem change. It's like pandemics yeah, and things yeah, like that, yeah. infectious disease outbreaks, vector-borne illnesses like Zika, and I mean, those are, those are huge. And then natural disaster response. I mean, I just heard today that Puerto Rico came. So that's Rico part of came, the science position. Yeah, so these are all things that he... Oh, because it's a bacterial... Yeah, yeah so yeah. so I, I didn't realize it was so broad until yeah. I did some of the reading. And, and for someone that works in this world, and this is all stuff right. we practice and prepare around. And, and he's an advocate for funding it, because if you underfund it, sure. then you're not going to get a lot of work done. And mm -hmm. then, you know, particularly an example of this is Puerto Rico, after 11 months, uh, is finally up and running with full power right 11 months right I mean and, that's a long time I mean and in and, and natural disaster could hit a coastal yeah yeah I mean the mainland I mean so mm -hmm. and you yeah know, and his career it says his career focused on atmospheric modeling yes of extreme weather events yeah. and and frighteningly right. we have many extreme weather yeah. events now Exactly. You know, just thunderstorms turn into mega thunderstorms. Right. We have tornadoes. tornadoes. We had a here. tornado last week in Webster. Yes, and there was something <laughs> they're saying the Bermuda High that's off the coast is off our coast, yep. and that's what's keeping all of this hot weather right. and and maintaining the thunderstorm yeah. possibilities in our area. Right. Which it's it's really literally changing the jet stream. Exactly. Isn't Is always it, the case. You know? And where the where the tornadoes, hurricanes usually form down yep. in off of off of Florida, right. they're saying a hurricane now could form off of our coast, east Absolutely. coast, because of the, the way warming the warming waters. Yeah, yeah. the it warming waters. Before West, the tornado went up there. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So two, exactly. two, and then last year was Brinkfield, or? Yeah. 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 So yeah. That, that's the voice of uh, wisdom, uh, Jim Cousins. Right, right, right. in the background. Um, yeah, Stephen likes our Facebook Live. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Stephen. So, um, so there are, this is, this is really good news hopefully Trump will listen right um, because we are in a place right now where there are these catastrophic right. atmospheric events right. happening and this right. man is uniquely equipped for this right and he's studied it his really his Kelvin. whole life yeah <laughs> I mean which is which is amazing and, yeah. and but also I wanted to add to the natural disaster response they look at nuclear energy and the effects on that, and then facilitating scientific innovation. Uh -huh. So those are all things that go beyond just really the the climate. I think it looks sure. at the world as a whole. Yeah. And and really so it's how climate we can, in more than just weather. Right. It's sort of right. It's yeah. it's really looking at mitigation. It's looking at alternative power sources. It's looking at you know how these things affect the earth. Like when we have nuclear energy, I mean it's wonderful because mm -hmm. I grew up around that, mm -hmm. but 
If Did you say it. nuclear or nuclear? Nuclear. Yeah. Nuclear. Yeah, I always Jimmy say Carter. that. Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter used to say nuclear. Yeah. Yeah. So, but Good yeah, thing. so that's something that, you know, can be looked at, but the, the ramifications, obviously, of, of the uh, spillage of nuclear. Right. Energy. Awful. Yeah, awful, it's really awful. awful. Yeah. So this is this other piece. Um, I just love a lot of little quotes in this yeah, article. Yeah, it was great. Um, I read the this Forbes is talking article, about it was amazing. The, yeah. the, this administration has consistently cut R&D, research and development yeah. budgets, but Drogemeyer will be a, a, a voice Advocate. for the benefits right. of the funding of research right. and um, standing up for climate science, which we've had all this climate change Denying. denial. Yeah. So um, continuing to well, shape the, the discussion yeah. around climate change, balance his academic background with the administration that spreads disbelief in humans' role in climate change. Right. We, we are completely affecting our climate, right. and there's been a lot of people that say, oh, there's no such thing. Right. Meanwhile, we have this catastrophic weather, right. Right. polar ice caps melting, ozone right. layer shrinking. Well, and it was something that was interesting that I thought about, um, obviously a little bit of brief disaster response, but um, <laughs> the the collapse of the bridge between oh, Italy and Spain. Goodness. Um, that is something that I thought was very profound because what we, we are dealing with, I mean, really, our global infrastructure for traveling is a, getting, you know, to 50, sure. 100 years yeah. old, somewhere around there, and it's starting to degrade. Of course. So with these higher weather events, they, they say weather was a big piece of yeah, this. I, I mean, that. obviously, the bridge was compromise because they were working on it but that's something we need to look at because more and more of these disasters are going to come up with the aging infrastructure yes and i would assume that would be something also that we would yep. look at because yep. when you think about how we respond and how we deal with um, climate change or um, absolutely really strong weather or weather that's hurricanes typhoons Tornadoes, well, flooding. flooding. All yeah, the I mean, flooding. We, we have all that. Yeah. Ruining. I mean, think of all the alerts they sent on the flooding. Well, yeah. we, we had cars that got lost in the North Floated Shore. Away. Again. Sinkholes because yeah. of all the flooding. Right. Cars are getting lost down. Right. They're floating away. Right. But I think that's something we're ignoring a little bit is that infrastructure. So, I mean, right. our everything is aging and all the work we're doing. You think about when you dig in your yard or you do work on your house, you can start fiddling around. It's more than what you think it is. Sure. And I think all the stuff that we're doing underground and the yeah, fracking, of course, fracking and the digging. I agree. And, I agree. You know, all of that. Destabilizing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think that has also an effect on the earth. So I agree. You know, and I hope someone like like this that you know really has de devoted his life to this type of yeah knowledge and this this expertise will bring yes some it's very encouraging good. very it, encouraging it news is. a good movement let's hope that his advice is t heated right um he run here uh says he warns that the current 40-year low in basic science research funding yeah. by the federal government yeah. so i'm seeing it dropping in my funding. Yeah. the funding yeah and and this says he could leave the united states far behind our competitors yeah. in decades to come but we need a so space force <laughs> i know space force <laughs> I'm sorry. I, had to throw I, that I would like the Star Wars theme to play at this moment. Right. Right. Anyway, um, <laughs> yeah. So, so he's arguing that we must have a balanced, predictable, stable funding for research and development, which I think right. I said before, yep. to be the leader in global research and development. Right. You know, I mean, um, the community will be at his back. You know, right. he's got the science community behind him, right. and 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 just the you know lay people can see the changes in the environment. Right. We see the pictures of the polar bear on the tiny little iceberg. Right. There's not enough. Right. You know. Well, even just in our day to day lives, we're seeing it, and mm -hmm. it's you know, but it's encouraging. So hopefully, you yeah. know, this is something they'll follow. And even in my world of public health preparedness, we don't know if we're going to be funded next year. I mean, so we have just even in my world, it's you know, it's yeah. tumultuous right now yeah. because. It's it's, it, there's the money is not going um, really for public health and for I mean this this ec environmental piece goes right into public health as well absolutely and, you know like I think we need to invest in that because really that's the foundation of life well the <laughs> not other to be, thing is you know but it just it's really the foundation of life exactly yeah, I mean and, if you don't have health you don't with have the anything. melting of the polar ice caps yeah. there Water. are bacteria yeah. being released from and gas. frozen yeah right and methane gas and all kinds of things yeah. emerging from that yeah. frozen state 
yep. because of climate change and because right. of the melting of those polar ice. Right. And these are things that no one thought about. We're dormant. Yeah, We're dormant, dormant diseases, and, and I think viruses, bacteria, exactly, funguses. Disease, all of that. I yeah. think people weren't really aware right. of what was in there because it was frozen. And it takes hundreds of years for humans and animals and plants and the environment to adapt to these different things that kind of mutate over time. Right, develop immunity right. to the various Yeah, and then if bacteria. it happens a little quicker, it right. makes it much harder for us to respond. Right. So let us know your thoughts on yeah, this. Yeah, we'd love to hear yeah. you guys join the conversation. Um, we we are a little bit appalled at <laughs> the change, say. you know, t- climate change, but we are delighted, I can say uh, together, yeah. that the Strogemeyer seems to be an excellent... Yeah. Um, pick for this excellent pick to yeah. join the administration maybe have a positive impact yeah. on on the president because yeah. maybe the president doesn't really know you know right. looking at things as fake news here's right. a man that can say well here's the evidence that this is right. truth so maybe this will actually Good. help in funding and be policy. a huge help yeah um, absolutely and moving forward yeah so, um, I think we're going to stop this Take a little segment break, now. yeah. Yep, and be back. We're going to talk again, similar to this topic, we're going to talk about the environment and some of the changes in the national parks. Um, and allowing... Um, Drilling, drilling and, and drilling. And, yeah, yeah, looking. And please join us. Yes, um, the please. conversation is uh, call us 78, no, 508 435 7880 or email us live at hcam.tv. Yeah, thank you. Have you join us. This week on the Chief's Log, Chief Ben Lee introduces us to the school resource officer. Yes, I'm a little officer that especially in light of all the school shootings and incidents that's been going on throughout the country, people just kind of assume that an SRO is just there to, to, to be security. No. But that's certainly not the case. No, that is a part of the job, security. Yes. And we've done a lot through the past years with Kathy McLeod to make our schools safer. Are you worried about letting your child take the wheel? Maybe you should also be worried about what you're doing behind the wheel. Have you ever sent a quick text just this once? Well, that might turn into a catastrophic accident. Monkeys see what monkey do. If you do it, why wouldn't your child? In a child's brain, almost all things their parents do, they can do too. 78% of teen drivers surveys text and drive. 59% said their parents do it too. Stop texting and driving, because if you do it, your child will too. Leaving my office pretty much the way it works. This week uh, on All About Hopkins, some slight difference in Jim Cousin sits That's down really with Hopkins it. Town Clerk, Clana Deegan. They actually have vaults. This is part of your job. It's awesome. I'll tell you that right now. Uh, anyone who hasn't had a chance to take a look at these vaults, they're all, it, as far as I'm concerned, I'm the, like, the protector of them, but it belongs to the public. People yeah. should feel free to come by and take a look and see some of the history that has gone to this town. Back. Yeah. So we are going to talk about the new change in some of the national parks um, protective status or protected status right. in terms of offshore drilling. Well, yeah, and, and so on March 28, 2017, um, President Donald Trump signed an executive order tied to present presidential executive order on promoting electric energy independence and economic growth. So that's what it was covered under. And it o- overturned several environmental regulation implementing during the Obama industri- administration as he put together a three-year temporary moratorium on the leasing of federal lands for just coal mining. Yeah, because Obama had drilling bans right. on, on lands, in national parks lands. Right, and it was to for three. To protect the animals yeah. So and in two, the environment. Yeah, he put that together in 2016, but very shortly after Trump becoming president, less than a year later, he, or a little bit over a year later, he lifted that and changed it. And so what's interesting is you say, why would people, how can we drill on public lands? How is this, this um, possible? And it was interesting, I found, a regulation that's called 9B, and um, the rules allow companies to drill for oil and gas in national parks. So it was interesting. I had no idea that this happened. So when the national parks were purchased, a lot of the land, so we, the, the nation owns really the top of the lands, but we have no control over the mining and resource 
um, makes pulling sense, out of it, right? which is so interesting. But yeah. this was this rule was um, put into place in 1978, the 9B, and it says it manages issues of the split estate. And I'll read you the way the rule says: For instance, where the federal government owns the surface land, which are the national parks, which I had no idea. Yeah. But private individuals and companies own the mineral rights below the ground. Yeah. So to me, that was shocking, quite honestly. So because the resources are claimed by someone else. Right. But the surface is used as a public park. Right. Yeah. So which is very interesting. I had no idea hmm. that that, and I, I mean, Obama, Obama had some clear foresight of, of putting this three-year thing in right. place. But I think it's, you. I ask why. I mean, we have enough resources. Why would we oil. change it? Yeah, why are why are we well, going into these lands? And it was interesting, they had mapping. Mm. So right now there are 12 national parks with 534 active oil and gas wells. What? Already. So they I were, thought, yeah, so I thought that was, so Lake Meredith has 174 Where wells, and Meredith? that's in northern Texas. Okay. And then, um, and the big thicket is on the coast. That's in um, northern Texas, landlocked. And then the big thicket is on the coast, and that is one. And then Padre Island is another one. Off the coast? Yeah. Um, yes, off the coast of Texas, way southern Texas on the Gulf Coast. And then we have um, four other states, and they're all southern. So the Cuyahoga Valley, uh -huh. which looks like I have to look at Oklahoma, think it, maybe? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Oklahoma's next door. So Missouri. And then West Virginia, there's the Galhee River and the North, Gorge, North River Gorge and Cumberland Cap, um, which looks like... I'm, I should have looked at Is that up. Tennessee? Yeah, that's Tennessee and Obayid. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you for the grade school. <laughs> geography, <laughs> no, I'm like, oh! That's geography is not my best thing. Yeah, no, and I'm usually pretty good at it, but I, the way I shrunk the map, I couldn't see it. And then 30 NASA parks where drilling could happen, so this opened because, it up. Because private ownership of the mineral rights is... Underneath, um, so so Grand Teton, which is near and dear to my heart, that's there. where I grew up on the other side of the Tetons from there. That's in, Mon that's in Wyoming. Fort Union Trading Post, um, the Theodore Reze um, Roosevelt. Um, um, so these are all potentials. For yeah, drilling. potentials. Yeah. Okay. So, um, but the Glen ones Canyon, on the coast. Great Sand Dunes, Aztec mm -hmm. Ruins. I mean, there's 30 more parks that are open up for drilling, and they really cover everywhere. The Northeast were spared. Um, parts mm -hmm. of Idaho and the Northwest were spared, but mm -hmm. pretty much everything else is kind of open season. Scary so, scary. which I thought was kind of crazy. Yeah, and this so the the thing I looked at um, talked about parks that saw 84 million visitors, supported 59,000 jobs, and earned 5.7 billion right. are threatened, right. including um, Statue of Liberty National Monument. Yeah. Everglades National Park. Oh, Everglades is a Alaska's big deal. Alaska's Glacier Bay yeah. National Park. So these are major right. tourist locations. Well, there are. I mean, the way I, I look, look at it is there, there are lands. So it's the, our land. The, 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 we purchased this, and I did not know that underlying rule. That seems, but yes. that happened after a lot of the lands were purchased. Right. Yep. So that was something that happened in 78, and I did not look at who the president, what president was in place at that time. When 78 that might have been Carter. Yeah. Or, um, yeah. So, but that's, but interesting you say the Everglades. So, Everglades yeah. and Big Cypress, um, in May, mm. um, NPS ruled that the Burdett, Burnett Oil Company, which leases rights from Colliers, could exploit for gas in the 70,000 acres in the Everglades Preserve. See, that's just, I can remember things like the Exxon Valdez. I mean, it's in court right now. Oh, yes. The Exxon. And, and they that's have, offshore. I, I that's just transferred. Them, yeah. I remember seeing them cleaning those poor ducks yeah. that got covered. They were, were going to die. Because right. that their, their feathers need to have that natural oil and that to resist water. Yeah. And they sunk. Right. They would die. Um, and then there was another thing. Um, just not to mention what it does. It, you know, it, it, so this seismic testing. So the, there was a lawsuit filed in July to stop, stop the exploration citing concerns that seismic testing would disrupt wildlife, obviously kill vegetation, erode soils in a fragile area. And you got to remember, yeah. that whole area protects a lot of Florida from hurricanes. Of course. So that's like a very marshy area. There's yeah. a water where all that, you know, a hurricane comes in, it can kind of leach and in there. And seismic 
parents. What kind of testing is that? Drilling or is that making well, seismic? Usually means I like think an earthquake. It's fracking. So, fracking. Exactly. So fracking. So I think seismic testing is where they look at the tectonic plates, right? And they see where there's natural sure. grass within that. So that's or and then also that seismic testing could erupt oil. So you could erupt oil and then it would come up within the middle of the Everglades. It ruins, yeah. But why, I'm asking why. I mean, wow. do we have an oil shortage? Do no, we, we have, don't. Actually, do we have a gas shortage? I mean, it seems like it's kind of at a surplus right now. Well, that's what I was going to say. But, I but have the heard thing that we're is, purchasing is, why less is oil. this? I mean, this seems like it makes no sense. Like, why? Whose pockets are getting lined? Or, or I mean, it just really. Uh, it, I don't know. It feels we would love very, to hear if anyone's yeah. watching. If you have an opinion, or or um, tell us. If you think this is a good thing, we, mm -hmm. we don't see it as a good thing. Right. Not that we always think the same, but in this particular case, it just seems like it's hurting several things. It's hurting jobs, it's hurting nature, it's hurting uh, people's ability to go to a beautiful place that's right. been preserved by the government. Right. And now that preservation is being removed. And it's a cultural crime. I mean, yeah. in my eyes, it's it's something that I've always, my exactly. whole entire life, I've gone to the national parks. Well, that's a very big, highlight our country we're very fortunate to have it right. we're very fortunate to have these beautiful spaces quality and to, of life yeah and i mean to me yeah. to sell out i mean it really it seems like a, well, really to sell so this out this is this is talking about um leasing federal waters mm -hmm. not just the national parks but leasing the federal waters for oil and gas drilling drilling in waters where it hasn't been allowed so it's not right. just the land yeah. it's under the water oh, off absolutely. the coast of alaska florida right. Nantucket. i mean there's Pacific. all kinds of places that yep. are so so it's you know it just seems like an obvious thing that's a bad idea right um and it doesn't it doesn't make sense unless it's just to change something that obama put in place but that right. doesn't make sense either or um, enrich people i mean that's i mean to me that seems well, like and it was interesting so some articles um also showed by doing this i mean you're gonna affect water tables you're gonna affect natural wells i mean particularly in pennsylvania and new mexico mm -hmm. the wells are connected to um aquifers that sure they're in these areas so All it's of kind that. of a protected area and i think anytime i, I am concerned about fracking which is a different tub subject right. anywhere well because but that I think opens you're up for fracking because that's mining and that's pulling out a destabilizing natural resource. right so yeah. if you think about just think about if you make a cake yeah and you put Open the a, oven exactly <laughs> in no, the middle make of a it. cake yeah. not even that but after you make the cake and you have that layer of frosting in the middle yeah if you somehow took out the layer of frosting yeah because you felt like Anyway, yeah. So then the whole cake's going to fall apart. Right. Why, why, it just doesn't make right. sense. And I don't even know. This is not even my area of expertise. Right. But just logically, it doesn't make sense to to bang the earth and shatter layers of uh, right. and and change the way that things have been but I think made up for so especially long. Especially where there doesn't seem to be a crisis. I mean, like you do something like this if you're in crisis. You're like, okay, well, we we don't well, have enough oil and exactly. gas and to run our in country. In response to a need. Yeah, there was a response to yeah. a need, and you can see why that may be lifted in that. But it's almost it it's almost feels. And I'm. This is my own opinion. I'm not saying I, it feels targeted. You know, like targeted one maybe the Obama era rule that he put out the year before, or really, I mean, to enrich people so they they get more but money. But I don't. Know the, I don't. So if anybody's watching and they understand, yeah, the benefit if you have more here information anybody, on this, like we I don't was, understand. So yeah. if you can think of some some, I mean, there does seem to be a surplus of oil. Right. I heard that there isn't as much oil being purchased right well why? Also because we because have of the trade wars. The wind right and, and, right um, <laughs> and this is saying practices. another thing in terms of water uh resource 1969 there was an oil rig that spilled 200,000 gallons into the santa barbara channel right california killed thousands of seabirds and mammals you know it's just um there's so many things wrong with it right i would like to know if anyone knows something that's right or something that would some benefit well, that's other than what more I was oil, looking. which we don't seem to I need. I mean, that's yeah. what I was looking for, is if there... Gas is not $4 a gallon. Right. It's under $2. Right. That's the only thing this is doing. Right. Right, right. and now it's, what is it, two eighty nine? Yeah. Yeah. Right? We can do that. Right. Jim, do you want to take a seat and join us? Yeah. That's the only thing I have to say. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, the it's thing good. is, is like, why is this? I mean, it really kind of makes no sense. And, yeah. I mean, like, it... it 
I mean, and, and I mean, may, I was trying to look for something good in it. So I was, I was looking, I was trying to find something good in this, the aspect of this, and I couldn't really find anything. And to play a little bit devil's advocate, like the people that do own that land yeah. under the national parks, right. I mean, that is their right. But it was happened after many of them, after the, they had been purchased, because a lot of the public lands were purchased way back in the 30s. Sure. Yeah, it's Theodore a, Roosevelt. Yeah, grandfather. So, yeah, so, I mean, to me, that was kind of but odd as, that it was put into place in 1978. But, I mean, but... Just to to probably yeah. solidify the understanding. Right, but but how, I mean, that's the only thing that I could find, that you're maybe taking money away from an entitlement to somebody that owns land underneath the national parks. But, I mean, unless I was starving and I, my children were starving and that was my land, I don't think I'd want. <laughs> right. You know it what I mean? It just seems like, uh, like, yeah, it seems like it's an unnecessary right. threat right. to our environment right. and our natural parks, our, right. our beauty that right. we have. You know, I think having nat I mean, national parks is something, right, that's a big piece of our culture and it's something that people find relief and, and peace and right. beauty and people spend money to go there. So right. it is good for our economy. Absolutely. You know, they were saying the jobs and the, and the visitors. Yeah. So it's not frivolous to say, let's not ruin this natural resource that we have right. and thinking about the alaskan situation yes. the alaskan national parks right. drilling in the alaskan area threatens right. you know all of that fragile wildlife right. that's already undergoing climate and again, change why i mean that's that's the thing that yeah. i i mean are we that greedy that we really need oil to be 10 cents cheaper or or it, for what do you do i mean like that exactly. that yeah that it just feels very Unethical. Yay! <laughs> yeah. And this is Yay! Tim Cousins. Jim. So bring it in. Yes. Actually, I've been listening. I do want to say one thing. Good. I'm going to suggest another segment yeah. because what you're saying is really right, and I think the answer is going to renewables. Yes. And I don't understand why the business community isn't getting behind that right. as a money-making opportunity. Right. Yes. Yes. Save jobs. the earth and make yeah. money, make Absolutely. jobs. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so renewables, let's ex let's explore that a little bit. Right. Yeah. Renewables, as in what? As in solar, wind, wind solar, and yeah. um, hydro, hydro power. Did right. you know California just ro reached its 2030 yeah. uh, goals? They rolled yeah. back emissions to 1990 levels. Yeah. Oh my gosh! Like why can't you know? I mean, right. We should do and all it's, that. It's revenue positive. I mean, it yeah. gives people jobs. It yeah. creates technology. It it it. it fuels and the economy. It, exactly. I mean, there are so many positive right. things. And I mean, really, we need to be looking at this. The more I, I look at the, what's going on in our world, it's, it's rather frightening right. to mm -hmm. think about the air that I breathe in. I mean, so I'm going to suck this all up while I'm alive the next 20 years, and then my no, daughter has to no, deal with the, right. the mess. I mean, is that right. fair? Well, the other thing is, I yeah. think, didn't, what, in an earlier segment, we talked about the fact that India and China are doing much better yeah. in terms of renewables is it, is it, and, yeah. and environmental Is it the Netherlands respect. or is it uh, Norway? I just Somebody, saw something. It's like going totally green. Yeah. I, Ireland, and Germany is coming yeah, close, yeah. Ireland, too. Is Ireland up. is doing something yeah. against plastic. Right, yeah. so other countries are actually right. setting an example for the world. And yep. it's, it's helping yep. their economy. We should be following. Exactly. It's helping their economy. Save the earth, make money, make jobs. All right. Yeah. We actually need to wrap up now. And we really want to thank our workshop crew because we have some people yeah. doing our sound and our cameras, cameras and who are have been in this fabulous HCAM workshop learning to be crew members. Yeah. And I would love to tell you the names, but I'm not sure all of their names. But we've so, watched you guys. You're doing an awesome yeah, job. Yeah, I'm sure they'll roll the names in the credits. And um, <laughs> so it is. this is a, a labor of uh, collaborative in a way. So we have a bunch of people doing Volunteerism, sound yeah. and, and, right, and they're volunteers. So we really appreciate the work. It's been great. And we'll see you next time. Thank, Thank you. you.